Thank you, ma'am. So in the next 10 minutes, I'll take you through what we see when we have a woman after menopause seeking for diabetes care. I think it's not uncommon, but the important thing is that when the postmenopausal lady walks into your clinic with focus on diabetes and blood glucose, I think we as physicians need to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. There are many small pieces of a big puzzle that we need to solve here, and I will uh, take you through some of them in the next 10 minutes or so. And I think the first symptom that I wanted to address was often the symptom of sweating and palpitations. Now, I think uh, when people have diabetes, we often do counsel them very well about hypoglycemia and the symptoms of sweating and palpitations and irritability, and it can be very, very variable. But when we are transitioning through menopause in a lady who's postmenopausal, I think it's important for us to counsel regarding the hot flushes that they experience. And many times patients do get confused with these symptoms because the, the symptoms are very similar. And uh, if you do not counsel them about that, these patients would uh, sometimes mistake a hot flush for a hypoglycemia, probably eat anything and everything that is available at that time, thinking that this is hypoglycemia and will land up with high blood glucose levels. So it's always very important to check the glucose levels when these patients have these symptoms to let them know that these are symptoms. And today we can treat hot flushes very, very effectively. I mean, SSRIs are available and uh, we can give them for a period of six months. We can improve the quality of life uh, significantly. Also, we can counsel them about how to avoid the precipitating causes for a hot flush, avoiding heat, whatever possible, and reassure them that this is not anything very severe. Sometimes patients do get very scared and worked up as to uh, what is happening. Right, so that was the first thing. The second important thing that we need to address in people who have diabetes and in a postmenopausal state is recurrent urine infections. This is also very important. This is one of the studies that we did in Valor a couple of years ago, looking at causes of mortality in, uh, uh, in hospital patients. And when we, we know that cardiovascular mortality is number one, but second is infections. And amongst the infections, the most common cause is urinary tract infections. We know about several reasons why postmenopausal women do have a tendency to develop a recurrent UTI, be it estrogen deficiency, the vaginal dryness, or changing flora in the vagina. So I think uh, it's very, very important not to ignore UTI given that it is one of the important causes for mortality. It's also important to rule out local causes, talk about diabetic cystopathy, to educate the patient. We've spoken a lot about SGLT2 inhibitors. We know it does not cause any serious uh, urinary tract infections, but just to counsel the patient to maybe drink water adequately, to avoid more frequently, to maintain that genital hygiene. These very simple uh, tips when we prescribe these drugs are helpful. And uh, obviously if no cause is found and we blame it to the menopause, it can be effectively prevented. Local estrogen creams do a very good job and uh, something like twice a week apply. Yes, uh, do a pap smear before that, but overall this is another very important aspect in menopausal women that needs to be addressed. The third important part of the puzzle is the calcium and vitamin D, uh, which is something that is often ignored. I think we all are aware that our recommended dietary allowance of calcium intake in Indian postmenopausal women is to the scale of 1.2 grams per day. And that would come with 1.2 liters of milk per day. How many of our postmenopausal women actually can consume that amount of milk? Probably <coughs> none. So yes, do prescribe at least 500 milligrams of calcium to them. Ask them about their dietary calcium. Encourage them to take more dietary. Why are we talking about this in perspective of diabetes? Because we know today uh, diabetes is regarded as one of the important risk factors for developing osteoporosis, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And the sad part is that often BMD is not very effectively able to screen this. Uh, this is the Indian Society of Bone and Mineral Research guidelines, uh, which talk about osteoporosis screening. They've included estimation of blood glucose as part of their uh, evaluation. And even for treatment, uh, when we talk of uh, diabetes, the thresholds are actually a little lower. Uh, what we are usually talking about treatment of osteoporosis at a T-score of minus 2.5 in people with uh, diabetes in postmenopausal women with diabetes, the threshold is minus two. So this is another aspect that we need to address. At times, if it's not been addressed and patients do go on for fragility fractures, yes, uh, that is even more scary. We know the mortality of uh, uh, a woman who develops a hip fracture, it's as high as 30%, even in the most developed nations in the world. So it's important to avoid drugs, anti-diabetic agents that 
uh, increase the risk of fractures, drugs like pioglitazone in particular. Also important to know that evaluation of these patients for fracture risk is a little different from what we talk in terms of usual osteoporosis. Yesterday we've had a brilliant workshop on osteoporosis evaluation, and I think it's important to understand that newer guidelines are coming up. It's talking about beyond DEXA scan, looking at parameters like the trabecular bone score, both the American Society of Bone and Mineral Research and ISCD today talk about that. We have it available in India and in some centers now, and looking at TBS is probably better in people with diabetes with fracture. Talking about the fourth, uh, the fifth aspect, ob obesity and chest pain, Dr. Benny did allude to it. I think it's important, obesity is a big problem. This is one of the community studies we did. A big problem of having obesity in elderly postmenopausal women. There's several factors that make this gender divide even bigger and definitely menopause stands out as one of the important things. But the important message that I'd like to leave you with, and we keep talking about our glycemic targets in postmenopausal women with obesity and heart disease, I think it's important to not generalize. It's important to look at how uh, is a geriatric category of an elderly postmenopausal woman. If they are very functional, we not have a generalized A1C cap of 8.5%. Maybe we can have a lower. So it depends on the ability of the patient, the quality of life that the patient is already le leading. And if it is good, we do see, uh, we need to tailor that to the patient. And the last bit that I'll talk about is about generalized weakness. Uh, I think uh, yesterday we had a brilliant plenary on sarcopenia by Dr. Anup Mishra. This is another important aspect that we talk about, especially again in terms of diabetes. This slide was shown yesterday. Uh, we know that sarcopenia is an important risk factor for developing metabolic problems. And uh, there are simple methods to screen for sarcopenia. We not always have the best of best DEXA scan. Simple things like looking for calf circumference may be uh, a good screening tool. And these problems are quite prevalent in the Indian settings. A recent study uh, we did where we found that about 40% of elderly uh, individuals in our country based on a national wide survey have uh, sarcopenia. And then again, the treatment and the counseling with respect to that. This was discussed yesterday regarding resistance training, regarding protein intake and newer drugs. So the cutting a long story short, the message that I'm leaving you with is that when postmenopausal women present to you for glycemic management, the patient does have concerns about glucose. We have to address that. But we as physicians also need to look at several different other facets which are interlinked with diabetes, be it just uh, the hot flushes, be it just the recurrent UTIs or the bone health that needs to be addressed, the cardiometabolic health that needs to be addressed. And this is all to be encountered in our practice. So I'll leave you with this and over to Dr. Benny.